This is Steve in Dallas, Texas. It's Saturday morning, and you, my friend, are listening to Light Talk. Good morning. This is Brackley in Las Vegas, Nevada, and today we are discussing staying home, responding to cryptic feedback, and good guys and bad guys, all on Light Talk. And this is David, coming to you from the beautiful Belmont Shore neighborhood of Long Beach, California. And if you don't already know, you are listening to Light Talk, and we are the Lumen Brothers. Well, welcome to episode 161, everyone. And uh, we have Brackley back with us this today, and uh, welcome back, Brackley. Thank you. Good is, to be uh, back. Las Vegas still there? It's still there. Yeah, I hear they're opening up Las Vegas. No, nope, no. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> No, contrary to what other people said, not yet. Although, maybe soon. It's good to have Brackley back. Uh, Stan is on vacation. Uh, <laughs> in his living and, room. Uh, in his living room. <laughs> so, a couple of things right off the bat. Recently, in the past couple of days, we lost two very, very prominent people in the lighting industry. One, of course, was uh, Steve Irwin, who is the founder and creator of Lighting Trainer. A lot of you know who Steve is. And, of course... Um, one of my former students and a great lighting educator, Matt Knudsen. He was a lighting professor from Western Michigan University. And for people in education, uh, you all know who Matt was. And people outside, maybe not, although Matt did have a very respectable professional career. But Matt was a pure educator. He was a great educator. And, and again, he... <laughs> He was one of my first students, by the way, which was amazing. I met him when I taught for a year at UMKC, University of Missouri, Kansas City. And Matt was a grad student there, and I was a guest professor. And I met Matt, and he was an amazing student. And uh, he went on to have a professional career and then start teaching. And he taught primarily at Western Michigan University, which is in Kalamazoo, by the way. But Matt was great, and he was there for many, many decades. And it was definitely one of the finest undergraduate technical programs in the country. He sent me so many amazing students, and he was a really wonderful person because he knew how to train these students. And all of the students that came from his program, not only were they incredibly competent, they had all the skills, but they were also wonderful human beings. So this is a huge loss to the educational lighting world. Anyway, rest in peace, Matt. So we're going to move on real quickly. And there's a, an announcement I want to make, and it has to do with the CARES Act. And, you know, a lot of you know what the CARES Act is. And there are two programs that I just want to mention to make sure that everyone who is a, an independent contractor at least understands that they can actually get help from these programs. But before we start, I just want to make sure there's a disclaimer here. I am not a tax expert, accountant, or lawyer. And I'm only trying to forward you the information as I know it. The Small Business Administration has these two programs. One is called the Paycheck Protection Program, which is the PPP. And that's very good for self-employed people who claim their income on a Schedule C. It also helps people who, are, who have LLCs. Uh, now, you know, from the name of that program, it sounds like, well, wait a second, they're talking about paychecks. You know, we don't get paychecks. Actually, they expanded it on the second round so that if you are an independent contractor and you get your income coming into you, chances are you're claiming that income on a Schedule C, which is basically uh, the profit or loss of a business. That fee that you're getting actually passes through right into your money. And the new version of the PPP treats that income as pretty much like you're getting a check. So that's a big, big deal for us because in the past, if you weren't an employee, it was really hard to prove all that. But now it's a lot easier. So I highly recommend that if you are in need of financial help, that you look at the PPP program and you can ask any bank, or just about any bank, there's a whole list of banks on the Small Business Administration website who are actually participating, but just about every major bank is. So call the bank and ask about the PPP. The other one is called the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, and that's really important too. What that allows you to do is actually get a $10,000 loan advance, and that loan advance is forgivable, okay? That $10,000 is forgivable. And that's one other thing I, I need to talk about the PPP also. It's the same sort of deal, is that you can apply for a loan, and that loan is the, the loan amount depends on how much money you earned from last year, uh, 2019. So 
Those two programs are out there for help. Understand that right now the PPP is still there and it's still funded. So you should apply for that as soon as possible. The Small Business Administration right now has not opened up the second round for the Economic Injury Disaster Loan. So we're waiting on that as well. So check it out. Go to the Small Business Administration's website. I think it's sba.gov for more information. Oh, one other thing. I posted on the Light Talk Facebook group page links to, to an article that explains all this, hopefully better than I just did in the past five minutes. <laughs> okay, Steve has our first listener question. Yes, it comes from William in Chicago. And Bill writes, how are you handling teaching from home? <laughs> oh, man. Uh, it, yeah, it I'd rather sucks. not be home. <laughs> it's, it's hard. I don't know. What are we in? Week four or five of teaching at home right now? Something like that. Um, four, four weeks, five weeks? Yeah. It's hard because, you know, part of our craft is uh, interaction with human beings. And these kind of Zoom meetings uh, are tedious. And it's tedious for the students. It's tedious for me. You know, what I'm trying to do right now is establish a schedule. You know, I've gotten a couple uh, kind of uh, whiny uh, Zoom messages from my colleagues going, oh, we're so tired of Zoom. It's, it's so hard. Well, I got an idea for you. <laughs> you know, b- build yourself a schedule. Uh, you know, get up and dress for work. Uh, keep the same kind of hours that you're keeping at school. Uh, take your breaks at the same time. Take your lunch at the same time. If, you know, if you've got a, some exercise built into your day, do it. You know, wrap up at the end of the day. If your day ends at 4 or 5 o'clock, if you're not in production, then end your day there. Don't just stare at your laptop for 24 hours. I mean, that's the problem is that, uh, you know, we're not uh, utilizing our time as well as we were when we were in our studios. What's happening now is we're kind of going, oh, well, I guess I can do this now. I'll do that later. You know, it's 10 o'clock at night. I guess I'll check some email. No, do it in your business day. Get a routine down and stick with that. You know, with any luck, we're going to be out of this uh, kind of Zoom world by uh, summer. It's looking like a lot of universities I was watching last night, Harvard is planning on opening in this fall. There are a number of schools saying we're going to go for this. Uh, Purdue is talking about it. So I, I believe um, as far as Zooming, I think that's going to disappear and we'll be back in the classroom in some way. I know at my school, SMU, I got a note today saying that um, they wanted to welcome faculty and staff back onto campus <laughs> May 15th. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, so going. if we wanted to... Uh, <laughs> if, we, if, <laughs> if we wanted to work out of our offices, and that might be good. It might be good to go to your office and Zoom your classes out of there, then come home at the end of the night to get kind of a schedule. But, um, you know, I, I think I'm going to avoid that if I can. Uh, and, and they're hoping to have, um, you know, everything kind of semi as normal as possible. I think Purdue and maybe Harvard both were talking about uh, the problem is not necessarily the students this fall. The problem is the faculty and the staff. So I think they're going to, you know, stick a mask on us and, uh, you know, some gloves on and say, go knock yourself out. I know we're gearing up. Uh, so that we can deliver the curriculum in the classroom. And then for those students who are concerned about coming back, we're going to simulcast so we can go right to their dorm rooms, I guess. And and, uh, the class will be delivered both ways. I think they did that at UCLA a couple years ago. I think UCLA decided they're going to put a camera in the classroom and it would be great. I'm not sure how that worked out. I agree with Steve. The setting the schedule is very important. Also, I try to meet with the uh, students uh, one-on-one every now and then as well just to see how they're doing and to kind of take their blood pressure. It's all different. What we do is really uh, hinges on our laboratories, which is doing theater. And when that's not around, it's hard to just do it on Zoom. All right. I'm going to be the contrarian. You don't think you're going to have a problem with the students, Steve? Just wait till one of them gets sick and you get the call from the mother and the lawsuits start. Oh, I think what I think I think I won't see a student. I mean, fortunately, I don't teach undergraduate, but I think if, if we deliver the curriculum online, I think there'll be thirty students sitting in their dorm room in their jammies watching me on television. Or a number of students uh, these days are not, are seeing this online and going, "Am I 
paying all this money to have online courses. So who knows how many students we'll actually have next year. I don't think this is going to happen. And, uh, and it's because it makes no sense. For instance, if you look at my school, uh, at my building, let's just say, okay, uh, there are no windows in any of our classrooms. Our classrooms are all different and they're all small and they have horrible ventilation. I just don't think it's going to happen, not until there is a vaccine or a cure to this disease. The lawsuits would be gigantic. Plus, I don't think the teachers union is going to allow it to happen. Uh, Not until everybody is assured that there's no danger. And right now, you can't say that. This is a virus that anyone could get. They don't even know if people are immune to it once they get it. People that don't have any symptoms are also carriers. Right. So we are assuming right now, at least out in California, that we will be teaching online next semester. Unless there's, you know, a, a major breakthrough, uh, I don't think that no one's can take the chance, especially when you are considering the health of the students and the health of the faculty and staff. There's no way you're going to take that chance. I was going to say, if there's any good that's come out of this, I think our students are learning how to communicate by computer yes. in, in a... Uh, in a very business business like fashion, more effectively, so, yeah, I Absolutely. think it's going to be good for them when they're you know. The, the, I mean, our students are uh, are working both East Coast, West Coast, and Middle America. They're living all over the place. Right. They're zooming. You know, they're going to be able to zoom into a conference in Atlanta and present their ideas to a theater company and be comfortable doing it right. in a way that uh, you know that maybe we're not. So I think there is going to be. Um, some benefits as far as marketing and selling yourself a little bit better. So that's, I guess that's kind of good in it. That's and and they're learning how to be succinct and get to the point mm-hmm. and, and move on. Yes, they had a class, my advanced undergrads, and they were presenting their designs. And five of them presented in like an hour and 15. And let me tell you, it was unbelievable. Each one of them did a fantastic job of expressing themselves, of organizing their thoughts, and, and talking about the play and the character. And I told them, I said, you know, guys, you were amazing, all of you. And I think a lot of it is because they are forced now into this type of uh, format. So, Steve, I totally agree with that. I think it's a great thing. Okay, Michael from the United Kingdom writes, my question is, what's the least specific bit of feedback you've received? And do you have any tips for making adjustments based on it? Well, <laughs> least specific bit of feedback. Now, this was actually posted on our Light Talk Facebook group, and it's about talking to a director, and the director gives you some cryptic bit of feedback, and then you have to sort of decipher what the hell that director just <laughs> said and what that director actually means. And a lot of the examples that we got from this question was, I like this lighting state. But can you make it a bit more interesting? (laughs) How about, can you make it look funnier? It has to look happier. Can you make it dark but light? It needs to swoosh. (laughs) What the hell is that? Swoosh. Are these the looks for my show? Can you make the cue more magical? Could you please add some of your special sauce? (laughs) I don't know what the hell that is. Can you make it feel a bit more morose? I want black and white only, maybe gray. Do you have any gray gel? I want it to feel as though the angels are singing. Rick Fisher posted this one. He heard from a director, the lighting is too interesting. (laughs) Can you just throw in some gobos on that two-dimensional piece that just flew in? More sophisticated lighting, please. And one of my favorites, I'm looking for blue but not blue, blue. So what wow. do you do with, <laughs> with suggestions wow. like that? <laughs> you know, personally, I don't mind emotional descriptors because that's the world that I think in a lot. So when they're talking about a bit more morose, I kind of have a feeling what that means, especially using the palette that I'm using. But some of these other things like special sauce, I, I don't know what that is. Uh, so what, what do you guys think? Have you heard any of these? Oh, I had one that sticks out in my mind. Uh-huh. I was working with a dance company, and the artistic director looked at me and said, you know, when I was dancing this piece, I remember there, were, there was always a light in my eyes. <laughs> you know, 
<laughs> okay. I'll find, I'll guess, yeah, just look in a direction. There'll be light in your eyes. Well, I think it goes to directors, maybe, who um, can't express themselves. You know, it's not easy to talk in the abstract about what the light cue is. You know, is, I guess they can say it needs to be brighter or it needs to be darker or it needs to be fuller or it needs to be more mysterious. But then after that, they run out of things to say. I need a happy cue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. What's the happiness here? The happiness quotient. Now, you know, what it comes down to is learning making that connection with the director and learning the vocabulary that the director likes to use. And the more you work with the director, the more you're going to understand it. And that has happened to all of us. You know, we work with directors many, many times over and over again, and it gets easier and easier and easier because when a certain director says, you know, it's not clear enough, then I know what that may mean from director A and from director B, it may mean something totally different. But one other thing that, you know, my students, uh, you know, I always hear this. It's like a director, usually an inexperienced director will turn to a student designer and say, it's not bright enough. It's not bright enough. And I can't see their face. I can't see the actors. Right. So what what does your typical student do? They bring up the front light. But unfortunately, the front light is basically just flattening out the the, And it may already be at full. Well, let's hope it's not. (laughs) Right. <laughs> I don't think I've ever done a show where my front light was in full. No, 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 no. But I'm saying some, some I know. Yes, that's true. Maybe it's at the limit. It's the contrast. You're basically making it's. Yeah, it's not only contrast though. It's actually modeling, mm-hmm. because sometimes to see an actor better, you give them high side light, or you give them, you know, a, a, a head high, depending, of course, on the composition of the rest of the light around them. But you know, that's what I would say. Is sometimes it's not adding light. Mm-hmm. Taking it away. A lot of times it's taking it away. Exactly, Brackley. And the other thing, with uh, talking about directors, I, I always like to, if I work with a first-time director, I like to go out and have coffee with them and just talk about anything but the show, just to get their vocabulary, just to get to an understanding of where they're coming from sometimes. And that helps. Okay. June in Utah writes, now that the states are opening up slowly, when will concerts and other live entertainment open? Well, that is a hard one, and it's hard to say because... Um, the states, we have 50 states, 50 different governors uh, opening up the uh, states at different times. But we're hoping by August, maybe. Yeah, concerts of 10 people, maybe, showing up. The other thing, June, is it's going to take a while for the industry to gear back up. Even if they say, let's start tomorrow, uh, you know, tours have been postponed. People are not rehearsing. Shops aren't building the tours. I mean, everything ground to a stop. So it's going to take a while to get everything going back up again once we're ready to go in in, in a pre-production and and becoming ready to go back on the road. I don't know. know. It may be be next spring before we see a lot of concert tours going out. So here's what I think. Uh, I was listening to Dr. Fauci today, and he is hoping for baseball season. To get going. Yeah, because he's a baseball fan. Yeah, but he's, sa- he's saying maybe June 2nd. And I was actually looking at some information coming from the Major League uh, Baseball Association. And, and, you know, they're wanting to get baseball going 100-game season by June. The stadium is going to be empty, but the players will be there and the television cameras will be there. So they'll be broadcasting it. You know, I bet you there are people richer than us who are thinking right now, How can I get the Rolling Stones or Gaga or Beyonce, you pick it, in a stadium? Yeah, private private pay-per-view concerts. That might, they might crank that up this summer. So all of a sudden that might happen. And that'll be good. You know, it won't be great, but it's a start. It's not, you know, 50 dates. Well, it's going to start up slow. Whatever happens, obviously, it's going to be a slow upswing. Yeah. And, and you know, so now, Steve, that you mentioned that, I think that's the most realistic thing that's going to happen because they can control it. I mean, they can tr- control the people building the stage, number of people. They can actually do social distancing with most of that. If you did something like the Rolling Stones, those guys are so old, they're not going to move around that much, right? <laughs> and if you don't have any audience, hey, there you go. It's perfect. So, I, you know, Steve, that you're brilliant. I think that's what's going to happen. I, I'm totally on your side. Well, you're listening to Light Talk with the Lumen Brothers, and Light Talk is sponsored by... This is a public service announcement from the Lumen Family Institute. 
These have been difficult months for everyone, but especially for lighting designers. Admit it, don't you miss focusing on a rake, endless technical rehearsals, or dealing with unruly stage managers? Or how about staying up all night worrying that your lighting design has completely ruined the color of the costumes, made the transitions even longer, and sent the lead to the hospital because you blacked out the stage while she was descending that insanely steep staircase? But I digress. Doesn't it piss you off that many people outside our industry cast us aside as perpetual children? Many of our countrymen are under the belief that we live a privileged life. We don't have to answer to authority, are allowed to spend millions of dollars on silly shows, and are ultimately not responsible for the lasting success or failure of our productions. At the Lumen Family Institute, we understand the great sacrifices theater artists have made for our country. Just remember... When you return to your, quote, frivolous profession, unquote, the next person who comes around and scoffs at what you do, remind him that as we all survived months of shelter in place, what would it have been like had we not been able to watch those amazing movies on cable, get hooked on series like The Crown, Ozark, and Curb Your Enthusiasm, wonder what will happen to Joe Exotic and whose private parts Darlene will blow off next week. Or maybe even watch great opera that are live at the Met, or that great Ken Burns series you never got around to. Yes, remind him that the performing arts are much, much more important than a sandbox for creative freaks. Because without us, he probably would have ended up eating his family. This has been a public service announcement from the Lumen Family Institute. And now, back to Like Talk. <laughs> Well, the sound of those ducks tells us that once again, it's time for our favorite segment, Let's Let's Talk talk About. And today's Let's Talk About segment is a continuation of our Good Guys and Bad Guys. And we're going to call it Good Guys and Bad Guys Volume 2. We started this Good Guys, Bad Guys list because at the beginning of this pandemic, several companies really stepped up and supported the designers who are out there and students, but the designers who lost all their gigs immediately and had very little, if any, income flowing in. And the students who unfortunately now had to learn off campus and couldn't use the computer labs at school. So like companies like Adobe offered their entire creative cloud suite for free for the students. And Vectorworks at least in my memory, they've always had free licensing for students, but they also opened up free training, which is another huge help. So they kind of made our good guys list at the beginning. However, today we're talking about the feedback that we are reading on the Facebook Vectorworks Spotlight Users Group. This is a long running issue from users about the Vectorworks service select fees. Uh, Service select fees is sort of their advanced customer service. Now, I have nothing against this type of fee, personally. I really don't. What I have a problem with, and what a lot of customers of Vectorworks have a problem with, is that during this time, when the income for professional light designers have been cut off, and they're barely making it, they're barely paying the rent, Vectorworks continues to charge this very high amount of money for what they call it advanced technical service. So I find it a little bit tone deaf right now for them to continue charging these fees, at least suspend them, you know, suspend them until the national emergency is over. So it helps your customers. That's the issue I have. So in the spirit of fairness, we wrote to Vectorworks and told them that we're going to be talking about this issue today. And if they would like to send us a statement Uh, that we would actually read here on the air, that they would welcome to do it. And they did, which is great. It's terrific. It's always good to get both sides of the story. So we received this official statement from Vectorworks CEO, Dr. Beeplab Sarkar. And excuse me for not pronouncing your name correctly if I screwed that up. But thank you very much for responding. Uh, But here's the statement, the official Vectorworks statement in response to this issue. There's been much confusion about our Vectorworks service select pricing during the COVID-19 pandemic, and we greatly appreciate this opportunity to set the record straight. Service select is our annual maintenance agreement that provides users additional benefits such as automatic access to new releases, priority tech support, and more. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic and its substantial impact on the world economy, 
and on all of our Vectorworks users, the pricing of service select renewals has become a topic of frustration. We understand. We didn't raise Vectorworks service select prices during the pandemic. In September of 2019, we increased the price of our service select renewals for a group of customers who owned service select prior to September 2015. These customer fees before the price increase were substantially less than customers who had joined the program more recently. Unfortunately, some of our customers are receiving their annual renewal notices now for what's to come in approximately three months. That's why we feel it's necessary that Vectorworks is providing options to our customers that are not normally available and helpful given the economic situation we all find ourselves thrust into. When you purchase a Vectorworks license, it's yours forever. The status of your service select contract doesn't change that. You will continue to have access to your license and files. For anyone having trouble paying their renewal, we urge them to reach out to their local service select renewal team to discuss how to take advantage of the payment terms or cancellation options. Here are the options for our customers on Vectorworks Service Select. One, if you're due on your Service Select renewal and you're not in a position to pay for the renewal, but wish to stay active on the maintenance program, you can contact our Service Select team or local distributor and ask about your options to delay or make installments of your payment over the next 90 days. Two, if the extended payment options aren't a viable option for you, and you must cancel your agreement, we're waiving reinstatement charges up until your next renewal date to allow you to rejoin Service Select at a better time for you. Your Service Select team or local distributor can help you take advantage of this option as well. And as stated, before you don't lose access to your license or your files, you can keep working with Vectorworks and pay nothing to do so. This week, we did another update to our blog where we make this information visible to anyone looking for it. How Vectorworks is helping customers during COVID-19. We'll continue to refresh this blog as needed during this challenging time for our customers because our primary focus is to support them. As always, Vectorworks honors the loyalty of our customers and maintains a discount to current pricing for customers when they become Service Select members and renew each year. So um, that's what's going on. What do you guys think? I just wish they would rethink. You know, here's the deal. There are other companies out there that also produce lighting software. And let me tell you something. If I was an owner of one of these other companies, I would be swooping in like crazy right now, offering designers who are out of work a chance to try my software for free. There is actually a petition going around right now that's on the uh, Vectorworks Spotlight users group on Facebook that is asking Vectorworks to reconsider these fees and maybe give their customers a break during this unusual crisis. And uh, I believe there are like a thousand signatures on it right now. I wonder how many users Vectorworks actually has. I mean, when you think about Spotlight, that is a fairly unique program. So a thousand could be a very significant number. Look, we know that Vectorworks has done a lot of great things, but you know, there are a lot of people out there, I see them and they have families and they're trying to, you know, just survive and there's no money coming in. So, so we want to thank Vectorworks for listening and we thank you for responding to this. So Steve has our final listener question. Well, on a happier note, uh, Toby in Amsterdam writes, what's integral to the work you do as an artist? So that, that's a toughie, I think. Um, you know, if I were going to you know, put on my cape and my little beret, I would say the first thing is probably awareness. You know, awareness of yourself as an artist and what you're trying to say through your work. Um, I've, I've often preached that imagination is important. Uh, you know, that's a requirement if you're going to be a lighting designer or a scenic designer or a visual artist. I, I think what happens is, you know, if you just look at children, children have great imaginations. And somewhere along the way, our imagination gets beaten out of us. I remember when my daughter was in the first grade, she came home <laughs> with a, a, a drawing of a tree. 
and the tree uh, was blue. And in the bottom right hand corner was an F, <laughs> you know, and I, you know, so I'm, I'm down the road to the school. You know, what the hell are you doing giving my daughter an F? You know, well, she drew a blue tree. Trees aren't blue. Well, who says tree? <laughs> Come on, you're, you're an art you're an art teacher. You know, trees can be anything. They can, they can be made of jello if, if you have an imagination. But somewhere along the line, we, that imagination gets beaten out of us, and we, we have a hard time getting it back. You know, we were talking about uh, Zoom to start this uh, issue of uh, Light Talk. I think good communication is really important. And, and as Brackley said, you have to get to know the people you're working with and get to know their vocabulary and how they communicate ideas. You know, I worked with a director who was just crazy. You know, he was pretty good, but he was just nuts. And one of the things I remember about him was that he would sit in about the fifth row of the theater, and every now and then he would turn around and look at me and point at his face. Well, that was his way of communicating. I need a little bit more light on the actor's faces on stage. But, you know, he found a way to communicate. So I think communications. Uh, the other thing is I think you have to have a really good understanding of the equipment you're working with. And I don't mean from a, a technological point of view how to take it apart or put it together. But those are your paintbrushes. You know, those are your pigments. You have to understand how to manipulate them, what they do and how to break the rules and ask them to do something that they're not intended to do. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, for my last idea here, I think it's about, uh, as an artist, developing a sense of play and a, and a, a willingness to engage and have fun and play with the design team, with the audience, and with the uh, the spoken word of the playwright. How do you, how do you got what what's integral to your work, guys? Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with you, Steve. All uh, everything that you've said, it's collaboration. I mean, just working with people, I find to be the biggest satisfaction of being a designer. Yeah, that's being a theater designer. Collaboration. I have to say the same thing. But you know, Steve, it's interesting you said about your daughter and the blue tree and, you know, the art teacher. Uh, it sounds exactly what Ken Robinson was talking about when he did that fabulous TED talk, Do Schools Kill Creativity? And uh, it is an ama it's probably one of the most watched TED talks ever. And it's about how we do lose, you know, as children, we lose that creativity because schools are pounding it out of them. But, you know, Steve, all this reminds me of a story that Ken Robinson told during this TED Talk. It was about this little girl who was in drawing class and everyone's drawing. All these little girls are drawing in this class and they're drawing whatever they want. And the teacher goes up to the little girl and says, what are you drawing? And she looks up at the teacher and says, I'm drawing God. The teacher laughs and said, oh, that's silly. Don't you know? No one knows what God looks like. And the little girl looks up. She goes, they will in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that tells it all right there. Well, the rocking sounds of the luminoids in the background tell us that once again, you've spent another morning listening to Light Talk. You can hear our show on Spotify, iTunes, Google, and just about every podcast site out there. Check out our website on lighttalk.org for future guests and be sure to follow us on Facebook and subscribe to our podcast on iTunes. That way you will not miss a second of Light Talk fun. No guarantee is offered regarding the accuracy of any statements or opinions made on this podcast. However, if you choose to litigate, the law firm of Fleck, Flock, Flair, and Glare and their paralegal Snoot will defend us until our retirement funds are depleted. Light Talk is written and produced by the Lumen Brothers, coming to you from Long Beach. Las Vegas and the Lone Star State. And be sure to tune in next week when we will be interviewing Vice President Global Live Entertainment Market of Roscoe, Chad Tiller. All that and a new sponsor. Where's my damn mix book? <laughs> Where's that mix Light book? Talk. <laughs> Light Talk. Broadcast. <laughs> Light Talk. Broadcasting questionable lumen knowledge and humor around the world. So we'll see you all next Saturday morning with our mix books. Stay healthy and stay happy. Bye-bye from Light Talk. Toodles. Bye. Light Talk.